we will continue with our lecture on Laplace transforms. In the last lecture, I explained to you what are Laplace transforms and then I started with the state space equation and then showed you how you convert that into Laplace domain and then uh, I talked about solving the Laplace domain equations as algebraic equations and getting the variables of interest related to each other. And then I also said uh, ultimately uh, if you do not get your answers in time domain, it is really not very useful. So, how do you convert the Laplace domain solutions to time domain is something that we also discussed. Now, in the last lecture, I talked about the inverse Laplace transform being a complex integration and uh, we rarely if ever actually perform that computation because people have already done that for us. So, I said the usefulness of Laplace transform really comes from the fact that there are these tables which can be used to do Laplace transforms and inverse Laplace transforms. So, I am going to pick up on that idea today and then talk about how this is done and then show you some examples of solution using this idea. So, a typical table is something like this that I have shown here. So, let me take some examples first to, to tell you how these computations are done so that you get comfortable with this and then we will not do this for any of this. We will assume these are all correct and then start using these tables for what we need to do. So, remember again the definition of Laplace transform. So, if you have f of t, f of s, it is already on the slide, but it is good to write this because you will understand and remember this quite easily. So, this is the simple definition. So, which is what you see here. So, let us say I want to find a Laplace transform for some input which I am giving. So, remember we talked about suddenly increasing the inlet flow rate in a tank. Supposing I have uh, inlet flow rate, let us say I call this time t equal to 0. So, remember whenever we do this time t equal to 0, it is not something which is wrong or it is not something which reduces the applicability of whatever we are doing. Whenever we start the experiment, we call that as time t equal to 0. So, that is how I want you to interpret this because this will come back again later when we do uh, control studies and so on. So, let us say I am uh, operating a tank at 9 in the morning today, I decided to increase the inlet flow to the tank, then that is time t equal to 0. So, from an input profile, if I this is f i t which I am calling as um, this small f t here. Uh, from an input point of view, supposing uh, at steady state it was 0, remember we would have defined things in the deviation variable form and then suddenly I increase this to 1 unit. Okay. This is a time function for let us say f i t which I am calling f of t in this slide. Now, what I want to do is I want to convert this time function to f of s because remember in the last lecture you would have seen that u of t which is the input should also be converted to u of s. Okay. So, it is not only the output variable which I want to compute is going to convert to Laplace domain, the input also has to be converted to Laplace domain. So, it is important to see how this is done. Okay. So, let us say I give a step input like this and then ask supposing this u was something like this which is step input, then what is going to be this function here. So, mathematically if you are going to define this u of t, so you are going to say u of t time function is 0 if t is less than 0 and equal to 1 if t is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. So, let us say this is the definition that we have for u of t, pictorially it will look like this. Then when we try to do this f of s, we simply apply the formula, it is 0 to infinity f of t e power minus s t dt, after 0 f of t is always 1, so I replace this by 1 which is what is uh, meant by this uh, step function then it simply becomes an integral e power minus s t dt. Uh, the integral of e power minus s t dt is e power minus s t divided by minus s between infinity and 0. So, at infinity this is 0, at 0 t is 0, so e power 0 is 1, so minus 1 by s, but since this is lower limit will be minus minus 1 by s, so I will get this 1 by s. So, you see this and then you will see here that this uh, unit step function is 1 by s. Now, just only once I will explain this. So, on this side as we see this table, I also have a condition on s. You can largely ignore this and this condition is uh, something called region of convergence. So, whenever we are going to talk about things going to 0 at infinity and so on, automatically there are certain conditions on s we are enforcing and all of those are captured by this region of convergence. As far as we are concerned, we will not really worry about this, we will simply ignore this and only uh, worry about the two columns here. 
Now let us take another example. So let us say I want to do this Laplace of e power a t. Again I do this e power minus alpha t I have a minus here. So you will see this is s minus a this will be s plus alpha. But in any case so let us say I have e power minus alpha t then the Laplace of this is 0 to infinity e power minus alpha t e power minus s t d t which is just the definition of, La of Laplace transform. So this is going to be 0 to infinity e power minus alpha plus s d t and much like how we did there. So this is going to be e power minus s plus alpha t divided by minus s plus alpha this is the integral of this and then if you substitute the limits and then simplify it you will get uh, s plus alpha. So here in the table it is for e power a t is 1 by s minus a. So if you say e power minus a t it will be 1 by s minus minus a which will be the same thing here. So you see that there is nothing very complicated about going the forward direction and then getting the Laplace transforms from these functions. In fact, you can work out all of these yourself uh, if you have the interest and the inclination. Uh, nonetheless, what has been done for us is that these have been computed. Now, the forward Laplace transform you go from here to here as I said before, but when you want inward then what you do is you look at this column and then find the function that you are interested in, in inverting and then see what is the equivalent time domain. So again as I said before this is a complex computation but we are not going to do this because we simply read off uh, on the back side. Now a couple of things that I want you to notice here is that e power a t this right here is something that we will use uh, quite a bit in inverting. So this is a row which is of importance and I will explain this to you. In fact when we uh, use partial fractions uh, the only really as far as we are interested in there are only really two rows that we look at and you can do almost everything with those two rows. The other row is what I show here and you will see why we are focusing on these two uh, as we go through this course. So just um, look at this, so this says if you have e power a t as uh, your time function the Laplace transform is 1 by s minus a or uh, alternatively, alternatively if 1 by s minus a is your Laplace uh, function then e power a t is the corresponding time domain function. Similarly, what this says is if n factorial divided by s minus a to the power n plus 1 is your Laplace function, then the corresponding time domain function is t power n e power a t. So these two are going to be quite important for uh, the, the kind of computations that we are going to do. So pay special attention to this. If you go from here to here Laplace definition you can uh, actually derive this but nonetheless at least uh, keep your focus on this because we are going to use this. Now these are not the only useful things as far as Laplace transform is concerned. There are other properties that are quite useful and that is used again and again in control. So I am going to mention some of those. One of those is called the convolution property. So what this basically says is if I have let us say a product of two functions in the Laplace domain f of s g of s okay and I am interested in doing an inverse of this. So I am interested in Laplace in inverse f of s g of s. So what is this going to be is a question that, that we can answer. So we will see that, that this is going to be equal to 0 to t f of alpha g of t minus alpha d alpha. So this is what is called the convolution integral. So whenever you do a Laplace inverse of this you would expect to get a time domain solution and the time domain solution is going to be this 0 to t f of alpha g of t minus alpha d alpha. Clearly just so that uh, we do some sanity checks you are going to integrate out the alpha and the right hand side will be just a function of time. Now you can also quite easily show by changing variables. So you can say t prime is t minus alpha and then this is also completely the same as writing this as f of t minus alpha g of alpha t l d alpha. So this also will give you the same result. So in other words when you do this convolution integral you can write it as f of alpha g t minus alpha or you can put the t minus alpha into the f and then write g alpha. So both are going to give you the same result. Now why is this important from whatever we have seen till now? Remember we 
got y of s as g of s times u of s okay. So basically I can think about this uh, as let us say product of two functions in the Laplace domain and when I want to get my y of t then this is simply going to be equal to 0 to t g of t minus alpha u of alpha t of d alpha and how do I get this g of t so g of t is basically Laplace inverse of g of s and u of t is Laplace inverse of u of s. So I uh, that is how I get this g of t and u of t and once I get g of t then I can do the g of t minus alpha u alpha d alpha 0 to t and then I can get my y function. So this convolution property is an important property that is used quite a bit in, um, in Laplace transforms. Now another property that is used is the following. So remember we had um, the differentiation of a function which is if I said I want to take a Laplace of df dt then we saw that this is going to be s times f of s. So f of s is the okay we will come back to that minus f of 0. So if f of t is your function uh, Laplace of uh, f of t equal to uh, f of s and if we wanted to get the Laplace of differential of f of t then that is going to be s f of s which is the Laplace of f minus f0 small f0 notice that this is small f0 so this is evaluating the original time domain function at time t equal to 0 uh, under the assumption of uh, deviation variables this generally goes to 0. Now you might ask okay so this is the integral what happens if I want to get the Laplace of for example 0 to uh, t f alpha d alpha. So this is the equivalent uh, in terms of integration uh, to this uh, differentiation. So here I wanted a Laplace of the differential I want here the Laplace of the integral. So and also notice here I write this as f alpha d alpha. So when I do this I will get this t out so this will turn out to be f of s divided by s. Now there is another interesting Laplace property also which is used which is Laplace of minus t times f of t. Uh, this looks similar to f of s g of s but now it is a product of t and a function in f of t. Um, you can show that this is actually d f of s differential of f of s by ds where f of s is basically Laplace of f of t. So these are all interesting properties which we can use later when we do little more sophisticated uh, computations with uh, uh, Laplace transforms. Now let us look at inverse Laplace transforms for general functions okay. So though I am doing this for uh, f of s so what we are basically interested in is supposing I got y of t that I am interested in after doing all the Laplace transform and so on now I have a y of s. Okay. So I have to go from y of s to y of t. So basically y of t is Laplace inverse y of s and the way I have got this y of s is through algebraic manipulations after I do the conversion from the ordinary differential equations to the algebraic equations. So in most cases we will see that this y of s is going to be of the form of n of s by d of s there is a numerator polynomial and a denominator polynomial right. Now there are also other than y of s there are general functions g of t for which I either need take a Laplace transform to get g of s or I have to take an inverse Laplace transform to get to g of t. So these cases also this g of s uh, will have the form of a numerator by a denominator. So the upshot of all of this is most of the things that we are trying to invert from Laplace domain to time domain from a process control case will be a ratio of two polynomials a numerator polynomial uh, by a denominator polynomial. So this whole, whole set of variables y of s, g of s, u of s, uh, d of s whatever it is. So let us do a generic f of s okay, which is going to be a numerator polynomial by denominator polynomial. Now our interest is once we do all the computations in the um, Laplace domain our interest is in moving this back to the time domain. So basically we want to get f of t from this. Now 
one assumption we are going to make and which you will see will be valid most of the time is that the order of the numerator polynomial is less than the order of the denominator polynomial. So, that is an assumption we are going to make uh, and uh, let us assume uh, to start with that this denominator is of order m okay. and from our high school math we know that when I have a polynomial of order m there will be m roots that are associated with the polynomial. And even though the coefficients of the polynomial are real, we know that these roots can be complex. Nonetheless, if the coefficients of the polynomial are real, if one root is complex, the other complex conjugate root also has to be a part of the solution. And we also know that the roots can repeat, okay. So, the same root can repeat once, twice and so on. Nonetheless, in the first step, we will keep this quite simple and then say the roots do not repeat. And let us say I have m roots p1 to p m. Okay, I am just saying roots do not repeat. Uh, however, I am not saying the roots should be real and so on. So, this p 1 to p m could be complex. The only fact you have to remember is if p 1 is complex then there has to be another complex conjugate root also associated with it. Now, we also know that this d s can be written in what we call as a root resolve form which is s minus p 1 all the way up to s minus p m. If the leading coefficient of d of s has been made uh, to be 1, uh, then we can always write this in this root resolve form, okay. In which case f of s becomes some numerator polynomial, we are not focusing yet on the numerator polynomial and you will see why presently divided by s minus p 1 times s minus p 2 all the way up to s minus p m. Now, an interesting fact is that I can write this numerator by denominator as the following. So, I can write f of s as some a 1 divided by s minus p 1 plus a 2 divided by s minus p 2 and so on all the way up to a m divided by s minus p m. So, what we are saying right here is that when you look at this expression, it seems like uh, the numerator has gone somewhere, the action is all in the denominator. So, the roots of the denominator have given us uh, each one term in this expansion and since they do not repeat the form is always the same. And what happened to the numerator? What happened to the numerator is the numerator is defined by these coefficients. So, these coefficients actually will tell you what the numerator will be or in other words if you want to compute these coefficients then you have to know what the numerator is, okay. So, the numerator information has been kind of subsumed or submerged into these coefficients a 1 to a m. But the real action happens because of the denominator roots and, and that is the reason why you will see as we go further in control the poles of the transfer function are the ones that attract lots of our attention. Uh, of course, the roots of the numerator polynomial also called the zeros of the transfer function which we will talk about later also are important, but a lot of the dynamics is actually dictated by the denominator roots. Okay. Now, like I said before, this f of s could be y of s, g of s, u of s, whatever it is. And then once we have done with all of these computations, we are interested in actually computing f of t or equivalently y of t, u of t, g of t and so on. So, we know f of t is Laplace inverse of f of s and due to the linearity property, I can take Laplace inverse of the sum as uh, sum of the Laplace inverses. So, I have Laplace inverse a 1 by s minus p 1 and so on. Now, you notice that irrespective of what the numerator and denominator is as long as the function in the Laplace domain is a ratio of two polynomials and with the order of the denominator polynomial being greater than the numerator polynomial, we can always do this if the roots do not repeat and there is a simple extension if the roots repeat which we will see later. And now the whole Laplace inverse which looked very complicated till now has been trivially reduced to only one row as of now uh, in the table. Uh, which is uh, if you go back to your table, you will be able to see this which is the Laplace inverse of 1 over s minus p 1 and you will see from the table the Laplace inverse of this is e power p 1 t. So, f of t will become a 1 Laplace inverse of this which is e power p 1 t, a 2 e power p 2 t all the way up to e a m e power p m t. So, you see how something that looks complicated, you know it could be any polynomial in the numerator, any polynomial in the denominator and so on. 
uh, simply reduces to only one row in the Laplace table and we can actually invert quite easily and get f of t. So, this is an important idea that you want to remember. Let us take an example run through it very quickly. So, let us say x dot is minus x t plus 3 u t y t is x t. Okay. Now, let us assume that I am going to give an input for this system u t is t basically what it means is I am going to ramp up. So, this is u t at t equal to 0 it is 0 and then it keeps ramping up. Okay. Now, I am going to ask the question saying if I were to give a function time domain function for u like this what will be x and what will be y. So, a quick way to do this uh, is to take a Laplace transform of this and if you assume that x is 0 at t equal to 0 then you know this is s x of s minus x of s will be 3 u of s. So, if you take x of s to the other side you will get x of s times s plus 1 is 3 u of s. So, x of s will be 3, 3 by uh, s plus 1 u of s. So, if I were to write this x of s as g s times u s then this will be 3 by s plus 1. So, which is what I have here. Now, this u s okay, is again the uh, Laplace transform of u of t, but since I am interested in finding out how the system is going to behave when uh, I give u as a function of t in a ramp fashion this is how u behaves with respect to t. Then uh, basically u of s to get that we have to convert this function to Laplace domain. So, if you go back and look at table you will see that when u of t is t u of s will be 1 over s square. Now, notice that instead of putting this into this equation and doing let us say solving the differential equation, what we have really done is actually algebraically said y of s and x y t is x t. So, y s is x s, y of s the output is simply g of s times u of s and g of s I know is 3 by s plus 1 u of s is 1 over s square. Okay. Now, when we get to this here, now you notice I have a problem here because if I want to do uh, remember I said y of t is Laplace inverse y of s and if I want to do an inverse Laplace transform then I have to do a partial fraction expansion. Before that let us just notice that I can think of this as a numerator polynomial by a denominator polynomial. The denominator polynomial is of order 3 and the numerator polynomial is of order 0 because there are no s terms there clearly satisfying uh, our requirement the new numerator polynomial have order less than the denominator polynomial. However, I have a problem if I look at the denominator polynomial it has how many roots 3 roots 1 root is minus 1 however, 0 is a root that is repeated twice. Okay. So, we will get back to this in more detail when you do a partial fraction with repeated roots what you basically do is you add as many terms as there are repeats. So, basically the expansion for this the partial fraction expansion for this will be s by s squared s plus 1. So, it is going to be some constant by s plus some constant by s squared another term because it is repeated and some constant by the third root. So, if it were repeated thrice then you do a 1 by s plus a 2 by s square by plus a 3 by s cube and so on and you can always do the partial fraction. Now, for this example if you do this partial fraction and then compute a 1, a 2 and a 3 it will turn out to be minus 3, 3 and 3. You can do this computation and then check whether this works out. Uh, so, I have written y of s in the last slide however, I did f of s the same way. I have these terms, I have the first term, the second term and the third term. Now, if I want y of t I do a Laplace inverse of this and I go and look up the table you know the unit function the Laplace in was 1, one over s. So, if it is 1 over s the inverse Laplace will be unit function. So, this will be just minus 3 and here you saw if t is your function 1 over s squared is your Laplace transform. So, if 1 over s squared is what you are looking at then when you invert this you will get the t and remember this 1 by s minus p e power e p t here p is minus 1. So, we will get 3 e power minus t. So, notice how I have solved this equation very nicely just doing uh, algebraic manipulations and looking at the tables to get the solutions. We can do the same tank example that we have been talking about this is something that we have seen several times this is the equation form. Now, let us put some numbers for this let us say I have uh, r is 1, a is 1, hss is 4 and so on. 
then if I substitute these values into this I get this form. So, this is a point that I made right. So, the coefficients of these equations do not come from somewhere they come from actual physical values. So, it, these come from what is the steady state height area the resistance and all that. Now, I can now get this equation and you know also notice that this is basically in the x dot equal to a x plus b u form. I can substitute those equations and then I will get this g of s function this is something that I would like you guys to work out which is 1 over s plus 0.25. So, basically from a block diagram viewpoint, what we have done is we have abstracted the whole tank uh, to this transfer function. Uh, and the input is the uh, inlet flow rate and output is the height and the hats basically represent that we have written these in deviation variables. Now, uh, the same kind of question that we asked in the last example which is to say if I were to ramp uh, was what we asked last time instead if I were to step the inlet flow rate uh, what will be the height ok. So, if I step then the Laplace transform of that is 1 over s and this equation tells me that h hat s is g of s um, f hat s. So, g of s is 1 by s plus 0.25 this s plus 0.25 comes from putting all the values from the last slide and computing this transfer function. Now, this is very easily resolved into some a 1 over s plus a 2 over s plus 0.25 and you can quite easily see the value of a 1 is 4 a 2 is minus 4. So, I can resolve this into this form and as I told you before now we have actually got a solution for the height here at this point without actually ever solving a differential equation. Nonetheless, I cannot give this as a solution to an engineer saying ok here is your height in Laplace domain. So, what does this really mean? So, to do that we have to convert it into the time domain. So, you know the inverse of this will be just 4 by s is 4 and the inverse Laplace of this will be 4 e power minus 0.25 t. So, this is how you are able to quite easily solve these equations and one of the things that I want you to remember is that these numbers and these partial fractions and these Laplace transform tables and so on after a while, while it make it sound abstract uh, it is not really abstract all of these are rooted in the engineering problem that you are solving and the knowledge and the parameters and the variables of the engineering problems have after a while been taken into the constants and coefficients of these functions. And while we are doing this we are actually uh, computing how the height in a tank is going to vary uh, as a function of time. So, hopefully given you a good idea of how we use uh, Laplace transforms to solve these equations and I have connected it to a physical system and shown you how we go from that physical system equation to a solution. So, we will pick up from here in the next lecture and then and describe more about how to analyze more complicated cases where you have multiple repeated roots and so on. And I am also going to show you some general ways of computing these coefficients that can be used. So, I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you.